Welcome everyone to Fusion EP Talks, a student-led webinar on fusion science and technology. Uh, this is a masterclass. Uh, it will be 40 to 50 minutes uh, long in durations with 10 minutes open for questions after the talk. Uh, my name is Dhawal Gadaria and it gives me immense pleasure to, to announce that we are back. And at the same time, uh, immense pleasure to, to introduce Professor Geert uh, Vardulaga. Uh, uh, he's an associate professor at Ghent University uh, in Uvent, Belgium, where he leads the research unit, uh, Nuclear Fusion, which is also known as the Infusion Unit. He obtained his MSc degree in theoretical physics in 1999 and the PhD in engineering physics in 2006, both at Uvent. Uh, his research activities comprise of development of data analysis techniques using methods from probability theory, machine learning, and information geometry and also their application to nuclear fusion experiments. In addition, he teaches master courses on plasma physics and continuum mechanics at the UHENT. He's also involved in international fusion education through European Fusion Master, Fusion EP, and also several joint PhD programs. He serves on the editorial board of the multidisciplinary journal Entropy and is a member of the scientific committees of several conferences on nuclear fusion and information science. Furthermore, he is a consulting expert in the International uh, Tokamak Physics Academy, uh, also known activity, also known as ITPA, Topical Groups on Diagnostics, as well as Transport and Confinement. And he's a member of the General Assembly of the European Fusion Education Network, fondly known as uh, FUSENET. The topic of today's masterclass uh, is about uh, the usage of data science in, in fusion. Uh, because in parallel with a similar uh, evolution evolution in society at large, modern data science is making incredible and uh, significant impact on the worldwide activities for the development of fusion energy. A fusion device is a source of lots and lots of complex data, not only from plasma diagnostics, but also from a host of sensors that monitor various machine subsystems and components. Analysis of this data, possibly from multiple devices and supplemented, with data from plasma modeling requires adequate techniques from statistics and also Bayesian probability in order to cope with the various sources of uncertainty. Recent machine learning techniques also have begun to make their appearances in many applications in fusion, including pattern recognition, prediction of anomaly, prediction and anomaly detection, uh, and several other methods. So in this masterclass, uh, Geert will first discuss the foundations of data science, allowing this type of data analysis. Then he will present a number of recent applications, uh, such as robust estimation of scaling laws, probabilistic characterization of plasma instabilities, sensor fusion, and predictive maintenance in a fusion device. Without further delay and spoilers, I will now mute myself and hand it over to Professor uh, Bardulage. Uh, welcome and enjoy the talk. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. And also thank you very much for inviting me here for this masterclass. Uh, as was mentioned already, so uh, my name is Geert Verdoorlager from the Department of Applied Physics at Ghent University in Belgium. Uh, we have been involved in the Fusion EP program uh, since the very start. I will end uh, by saying a few words uh, about that. Uh, but first, indeed, uh, yeah, so there is my talk, uh, but I would like to uh, summarize on the one hand, uh, the state of the art um, in, in, in our research on applications of, uh, I call it modern data science here in fusion, although part of the, uh, the, the motivation of my talk is also to show that um, there are many um, very exciting developments in uh, machine learning and data science, uh, indeed in the society at large and also in fusion. But of course, that doesn't mean that uh, we have forgotten about the foundations that um, on the one hand are still very much active and, and uh, research is being done in that and have their own applications and on the other hand, form the foundations indeed of uh, more recent uh, techniques uh, from machine learning, which uh, in, 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 in all cases have their own uh, 
uh, use application areas, but often also uh, with respect to speeding up certain parts of, of uh, data analysis uh, that we are working on. So, um, yeah, so this is going to be the overview of my talk. Uh, so start with uh, logically some foundations and then immediately go into a number of uh, areas that, uh, yeah, on the one hand, my group is active in, in Ghent, but on the other hand, I think also covers uh, several areas of application that, that nowadays are common in application of data science methods to fusion. So that would be probabilistic characterization of stochastic plasma phenomena. Uh, there are many stochastic plasma phenomena. Um, regression analysis, so scaling laws. Um, information integration, also sometimes called integrated data analysis. And then something more recent on anomaly detection and predictive maintenance. So, uh, yeah, what is data science? Uh, I remember last time I also gave a small introduction first. I want to go a little bit quicker here. Uh, I think many people already know that. That there, are, there are first, on the one hand, a lot of activities <clears throat> uh, that require uh, or that could be characterized as data science. So there is, um, if we go from the more low level activities, and I don't mean that in a demeaning way, of course, I mean, it is closer to the basic, the raw data. Uh, we start with data processing, you could say. So the cleaning, the filtering, the visualization, and uh, uh, very important because uh, lots of the uh, a large part, let's say, of the job of a of, of a data scientist is exactly this. Uh, so it's it's very rare that you get the data in a very um, ready-made form to start doing your uh, fancy data analysis. Uh, th this is, takes a large part. So the acquisition of the data, obviously, and then uh, the low-level processing. And then there are various application areas. Optimization is a very well-known one, uh, but also then more on the statistical side, estimation, testing of certain hypotheses, and then prediction. Uh, and then more uh, recently, you could say, in the realm of machine learning, we have pattern recognition, clustering, regression analysis, dimensionality reduction. I will explain some of these things. But you already see that. Uh, several activities that we normally think of, okay, this is mm, statistics, uh, for instance, regression analysis, is actually also part of what one does in machine learning. Um, so the, the fields very much overlap and, and, um, and sometimes depending on the background or the, the application area, the techniques differ a little bit, but there's a lot of overlap. So what are the methods, probability theory, statistics, uh, machine learning, and then more recently, artificial intelligence. Sometimes you hear this term or even machine learning used as a cover for everything, but it's I, I like to make more of a distinction between this. So for me, artificial intelligence is a very specific goal for, uh, yeah, like, you know, recently these uh, chat uh, programs that have been, it's not a program, but it, it's, it's a model that has been trained on the basis of a lot of data and that appears to uh, exhibit intelligent behavior. But part of my, um, my talk is also about creating awareness for the culture of data science. And, and this, I think, in fusion, I'm sure I, I said the same thing last time as well, but in fusion, this is increasing, it's improving, but it's still going relatively slow and uh, is certainly not as far advanced in as compared to some other data intensive, um, uh, you know, big data uh, initiatives such as astrophysics, particle physics, where Mm, the data science is very much much part of, of the overall culture and, and the publication culture, the work culture, and so on. So this, to me, is a very important aspect to uh, create awareness for best practices, uh, to train people, uh, of course, 
and also what i mean by community exchange is indeed to come to 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 to, to um uh, exchange expertise and be best practices training with other data intensive communities uh, in the physical sciences but also uh, in the life sciences uh, and then in the computer sciences of course um, another important mes message of my talk i already mentioned it briefly is that okay to me foundations of uh, what one calls machine learning uh, it lies in probability and and it's not only to me it's that that's just the way it is so um, to to talk about machine learning is first to talk about uncertainty and probability um, and to quantify probability there are various approaches but we and certainly in fusion also people uh, tend to use quite a lot the Bayesian approach. And there, uh, I don't want to go into the details of how it is different from other approaches, but um, these are the, the, the basics here. Though. So probability distribution quantifies uncertainty. And uncertainty is indeed lack of information. And that could be lack of information as to the precise value, if there is something like a precise value, of some quantity in the plasma, because there is fluctuation, uh, but there is also noise in the diagnostic. Um, but it could also be uh, what one sometimes calls epistemic uncertainty, is that uh, indeed there is this lack of uncertainty about um, I have a, a bag of, uh, of of colored balls, and I I, I just don't know uh, what is the fraction of, for instance, black to red in that bag before I start collecting data. But beforehand, you can already make, um, perhaps based on some other information, make a statement about that. It's lack of information, but still you might be able to quantify that. And usually we do that with a probability, which would be a real number be uh, in between zero and one. Also there, there are other uh, approaches. Um, in the Bayesian framework, this is always conditioned on known information. So probability or probability distribution is always conditional. We indicate that with this uh, bar. Um, and and uh, so you would say the probability of A occurring conditional on B. There you, the message is you always have some background information um, that, that serves to give you some information on uh, whether A is true or not. And uh, sometimes we, we denote that in this, this way, a very generic way where I means some background information. So a probability becomes a two slot uh, function. You always have to fill in both slots. And this is an extension of logic where this is more deterministic. Well, we want now to quantify uh, the, the degree to which B implies A, a degree of plausibility, but of course, and this is sometimes a criticism based on probability subjective, because what is a degree of plausibility? But there are strong requirements of consistency. That means that in principle, if, and, 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 and we recognize that that is in principle, but because in practice it's very difficult to realize, if two people would have exactly the same information, they should, uh, come with uh, this probabilistic reasoning to the same conclusion. Uh, and at the same time, we recognize that in every scientific statement, there is uncertainty involved and there is always going to be some subjectivity involved, which we try to minimize, but it's unavoidable. And, and these uh, are the pictures of Thomas Bayes and Pierre Simon de Laplace who were the founders, you could say, of Bayesian probability. This you probably uh, might have seen before, uh, very important a theorem that underlies Bayesian probability. And, and it allows you to invert these conditional probabilities. You see that here I have X conditional on theta. Here I have theta conditional on X. And um, 
typically in, in our setting, X would be data and theta would be some vector, typical in the physical sciences, a vector of model parameters that are unknown and you want to estimate them. Or put in a more Bayesian way, we want to obtain the posterior distribution, posterior meaning after having observed the data, of the probability distribution of that vector of model parameters, which will be a multivariate distribution if there are multiple parameters. And so Bayes' theorem tells you that actually quite simply, very, very simple theorem, uh, that probability distribution, the posterior, is the product of the likelihood that actually measures the misfit between model and data. And we'll give you an example in a minute. Multiply it very simply with a, what we call a prior probability or probability distribution that tells you the uh, something about the parameters before <clears throat> you did the measurements. <clears throat> Uh, so the point being that uh, you always have some prior information. It could be expert knowledge by an expert in the field or more diffuse, diffuse knowledge. Um, then there is a in the denominator, the evidence that tells you something about the probability uh, of the data in light of a certain measurement model uh, that, that generates uh, the data. And then you arrive at the posterior distribution. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> a very simple example, you all know a Gaussian distribution, and this is the way we would write that in a Bayesian way. So the probability that a certain quantity X has a certain value, well, it follows this distribution. If it's close to, the, there is a lot of high probability density close to the mean, and, and the deviation from the mean is characterized by that standard deviation. So it gives that probability density or finite probabilities in a certain interval. And then going, so this, this would be the likelihood then. You see that it characterizes indeed a misfit between the parameter that you want to know because we want, we may, we will see that we will want to estimate the mean of the distribution given the data. So this is the misfit between your model, which in this case is very simple. It's, it's just the mean itself, but it could be a whole formula with a lot of parameters in it. And and uh, uh, okay, and and <clears throat> that misfit is characterized by that likelihood distribution. Now we want to invert it. So you want to obtain that posterior distribution, probability of the mean given the data. Obviously, if you have only one data point the mean is quite logically going to be that value. If you have multiple data points, the idea is that gradually you become more certain of the estimate of the true mean of the underlying distribution. And if you have multiple measurements, what you could do is assume that they are statistically independent. So you could just multiply all of the individual likelihoods. And that means, uh, you know, the properties of the exponential, you get the sum over all the n data points of what is uh, written here in the exponential. And here for the moment, I have assumed that your standard deviation is no uh, from some previous experiments perhaps. Now, you remember also that you still need to multiply with this, this likelihood with the prior. Uh, I said you could use Diffuse knowledge, diffuse, for instance, being, uh, I just don't know where uh, the mean is. So I'll leave it open, could be minus infinity until plus infinity. And uh, luckily, not in all circumstances, but in this circumstance, it works. And since it's the same, you, so you're, it's a flat distribution. You're So in fact, you can just multiply this with some, unknown uh, number and you get this proportionality. Uh, you also remember that there's, the, there's this evidence in the denominator, but for estimating parameters, it doesn't play a role. You see theta doesn't appear here. So we can also uh, treat it like uh, an, um, a multiplicative constant. So in fact, 
that's very funny. The posterior looks exactly the same as the, as the, the likelihood, except that the, the, the interpretation is completely different. Now, this is not a probability distribution anymore for the data. It's a distribution for this other quantity here. And again, it could be a complicated formula with many other parameters. So this would be a very non-standard distribution. However, since mu appears here in such a simple way, it turns out that if you carry out that you can carry out this sum in such a way that this distribution is proportional to this one. And now I think you start to see what is happening. This distribution here again looks like a Gaussian distribution, except here you see this n has appeared here. So this is again a Gaussian or a normal distribution with itself as its mean, uh, the average, the sample average of all your data, the standard deviation is the square root of this quantity. So you see this very well-known rule, uh, if you increase the number of measurements, your distribution of that parameter will become narrower and narrower. This is also very characteristic of Bayesian probability that we can say we can say that a parameter is of, of your distribution is just another quantity that is uncertain. So it follows a certain probability distribution. It is very different from the more classical statistics where parameters of a distribution are supposedly fixed but unknown quantities, but they are assumed to have a hidden fixed value. So they don't follow a probability distribution, they're fixed numbers. Not so in Bayesian probability, everything uh, follows a certain distribution because everything has a certain uh, has a uncertainty attached to it. Um, yeah, so you could ask the question, okay, what happens if sigma is unknown? Because here you assumed sigma is known. Well, you can also do that. Turns out that the good prior is, not, now I have to take into account this prefactor, you know, in a, uh, which is was there as well, but I assumed it to be known. This turns out to be a good prior. And now you have to consider the joint distribution, as we call it, of mu and sigma. Of course, usually you're interested only in the distribution of a single quantity. And then you have to do what is called marginalization. So we're going to integrate out sigma. And then again, I get my distribution of the mean. Or I could have integrated out the mean and get the distribution of sigma. What is the result now of assuming that sigma was unknown? Well, uh, that, that information has to come from somewhere. It obviously comes from the data uh, because in the prior there was not much information. Um, so this turns out to be a student T distribution, which is a distribution that has a somewhat heavier tails. So it also goes to zero towards infinity, like the Gaussian, but much slower. So the effect has been that your distribution is uh, uh, has has a, quite a lot of probability as compared with the Gaussian distribution in the tails. That is sort of your the price you had to pay for assuming that sigma was unknown. And this illustrates the marginalization. And here you have a bivariate distribution. And you just project it. You see that's kind of projecting those distribution. That's what marginalization is. Um, normally, we are not so lucky in Bayesian probability that the posterior distribution is a well-known form like normal uh, student, uh, uh, Cauchy distribution, a chi-squared distribution or whatever. And then it's a non-standard distribution that you have to create samples from. and that we typically do with uh, MCMC, Markov Chain Monte Carlo methods. And the, the principle is exactly what is illustrated here. So here, x1 and x2 are two parameters. So 
theta one or theta two, you could say. And this is their joint probability distribution. You look, you see that it looks quite strange, not Gaussian at all. It's not an ellipse. Uh, the contours are not ellipses. So quite non-standard. What you're going to do is numerically walk over that distribution as you see the blue line doing. And the algorithm is designed in such a way that it's going to preferentially sample in areas where the probability is high. So it's not going to waste time in areas somewhere at infinity where there is very low probability. No, it will find that area of high probability and sample from there, and then create a lot of samples from the joint distribution. Once you have such samples, you can calculate their mean, you can calculate their uh, variance, and these are called Monte Carlo averages. So you can calculate any function of those samples, and and it it's going to follow the 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 right distribution if it has converged. Okay, let me let us look at a few applications. So uh, we start with probabilistic characterization of stochastic plasma phenomena. Uh, now, of course, yeah, why a probabilistic approach? I think it's clear that in a plasma, uh, for instance, a fusion plasma, many quantities, if not all actually, um, have, have quite some uncertainty attached to them. Um, and sometimes you are interested in measuring some plasma quantity, like the density or the magnetic, magnetic field in some location at some time. And it will have some error bar, some uncertainty, uh, because uncertainty is introduced in the measurement model, in the diagnostic, there is noise and so on. Uh, different types of uncertainty. Um, and we're going to want to quantify that, maybe just for the goal of, of specifying error bars. We would possibly also like to compare different levels as an, of uncertainty or I could call it differently, but basically it's the same thing. Variability, fluctuations, when I state this word, it implies something different, I would say. You know, so sometimes, depending on your goal, you could be interested in measuring the density and you're interested in one number. So many electrons per cubic meter at that position, at that time in the plasma. You also know that if you would have measured like one second or let, one millisecond, let's say, later, you would have gotten a different number, slightly different perhaps if, under, if you're in steady state conditions, but nevertheless different because there is not only measurement uncertainty like noise created by uh, thermal agitation of the particles in the electrical circuit, which we're not interested in. That's why we call it noise. We're not, because we're not interested in it. My point is that there is also a different level of uncertainty, which depending on your goals, you could call noise, namely the fluctuation in the density itself due to complicated uh, transport processes and general turbulent uh, transport processes. Uh, that make that cause the density to even in a finite uh, in, in in some uh, small volume element to fluctuate uh, and these fluctuations you could call them noise if you're interested in one number but other people who are interested in the distribution of those fluctuations and this is one example of a pdf on a log scale of uh, fluctuations of <clears throat> saturation current measured by a probe in the edge plasma of several fu uh, fusion devices. And here we are interested as, uh, uh, specifically in the physics of those fluctuations. So that's my point here. Variability could be a nuisance, and then you usually call it noise, but it could be also of interest because you want to study that uh, fluctuation. And there's another more practical uh, use of, of such uh, fluctuations. Um, if a certain quantity follows a probability distribution, you could be interested in what happens here 
in the tail of the distribution. This is a distribution just to, to, to set the stage for temperatures measured on Earth. And you could say most of the time, the temperature is going to lie in this acceptable range. But then once in a while, there is a certain small but finite probability if you, you sum here, you integrate this, you, you arrive at a finite probability of exceeding some uh, 100 year extreme temperature. So these extreme events that also uh, characterize not only climate, clim climatological uh, events, uh, so like large storms or hurricanes or um, but also geological events like uh, earthquakes uh, also occur and are of interest in fusion um, and the example that I'm going to give is that of plasma instabilities like edge localized modes uh, edge localized modes so elms and here we are interested in characterizing with probabilistic techniques Elm properties. And that is the, the application that we have been working on. And where you could also think sometimes the size of the elm most of the time could be in an acceptable range, but then once in a while you could have a large elm that could damage the, the plasma facing components. So you want to characterize that. So here probability inevitably starts to play the role not only of characterizing uncertainty error bars but the probability itself becomes of interest we have also been looking at pedestal characteristic in the age mode uh, the critical amplitude for um, tearing modes to lead to a disruption turbulent fluctuations I already mentioned that uh, um, and and then events leading to material damage but there are many more phenomena in fusion plasmas that you could say are stochastic and we need to quantify that. Then it could be that these stochastic events, think again of elms, form certain regimes. You know, perhaps that there are different types of elms. And then you have to quantify that even though the, the, the property follows a certain distribution, well, it could for, uh, um, follow different distribution under different circumstances. And there are properties of elms that follow a different distribution uh, for type one elms compared to type three elms or, or large and small elms. And then you could be interested, so that you have these clusters of, of, uh, uh, of probability distributions or trends. How does the distribution change? when the plasma parameters change. You would like to compare this across machines and you would like to relate this to the underlying physics and to be able to control properties of probability distributions. The point then is, well, first, this is in a two-dimensional space. I want to quantify this probability with some distribution model, a model, but then, think again of these different regimes, type ones versus type threes, I would want to also quantitatively compare to probability distributions. How can you do that? That's something that we have also been working on. And there are many ways to do that, but one way is exactly information geometry, which is a, um, an important, although not so well known subfield of probability where uh, probability distributions like the Gaussian distribution um, are treated with geometric methods. And they tend to form uh, manifolds as so curved surfaces or multidimensional spaces that are curved, where the coordinates are the parameters of the distribution. And then you can, in statistics, define a metric like in general relativity or differential geometry, you know that there are metrics to calculate then the shortest distance between two points on the manifold. Well, here, uh, information geometry allows you to calculate the shortest distance between two probability distributions. Sounds very abstract perhaps, but here you have such a curved surface and perhaps you would be surprised to hear 
that this is one model of the surface of Gaussian probability distributions. So the, you, you know, Gaussian distribution has a mean and a standard deviation. Well, this is a surface where the mean uh, is, is uh, measured in this as a mutual direction, you could say. And the standard deviation is measured up in, in the actual direction. This surface is called a pseudosphere. Uh, as opposed to a sphere, which has everywhere positive curvature, a pseudosphere has everywhere constant negative curvature. And look at these curves here, which represent Gaussian distributions. Uh, you see the mean of a Gaussian distribution. And here below, I have drawn another Gaussian distribution with the same mean. You see, it's the same mean, but it's much wider. So different standard deviation. Well. The purple one is this point with that mean and that standard deviation. The, the, this, the, the magenta one um, or the cyan one here is this point. So it's up the pseudosphere, higher standard deviation, but the same mean. And similar for these, the orange one is here and the purple one has also the same uh, mean as this one, but different standard deviation. And then the question is, well, are these two distribution closer to one another or are they closer? And uh, well, the mean is different, it is the same in, in both pairs. So only their standard deviation differs. Perhaps in this case, you will not be too surprised to learn that it's the bottom two distributions that are close together. and that follows the interpretation also of a probability distribution because they overlap more. So they agree more on the information that is available about whatever quantity that you're trying to describe. And for this, you have to use um, so uh, uh, information geometry to measure distances. And, and that's what we use it for. So if I go back to the example of the elms, what so every peak that you see here is an, an edge localized mode happening in jet, fusion device jet. And what you see is the light coming from the, the boundary plasma. And uh, it, it's, it, it's a marker for the fact that an instability uh, an MHD instability occurs there, which uh, causes the edge plasma sort of to uh, release energy and particles and that uh, then make it towards the, the plasma facing components. Um, you see every elm is different and that's a, exactly what is stochasticity. There is a fluctuation. And here we are interested in how exactly one elm is different from another. It's clearly not deterministic, it's something stochastic. Uh, the, the time between two elms is every, every time slightly different. The size of the elm, which here you could say is a pro, uh, the, the height of this peak is a proxy for the size of the elm, every time different. And so we want to look at probability distributions of these quantities. And here you see a few. So for a series of elms, we have calculated always the interim time, measured the interim time. And um, we were interested in these distributions, what models they form. You see here, it's sort of Gaussian, you could say. Here, totally not. There seem to be even two peaks. Here, it's also not Gaussian. It's more skewed. Yeah? Remember these uh, skewed distributions where, where there could be some extreme events here on, on uh, at, at uh, a large um, interim time. Uh, so, so that's interesting. Well, how does this, do this distribution compare if you change the plasma parameters of be or between devices? And again, if you want to do that quantitatively, you need a distance measure between distributions. So that's where that information geometry comes in. Uh, here, every point is a series of elms and, and uh, the, the, what is on the axis is the, pro the parameters of some probability distribution that characterizes this, that 
series of elms. And, and you see there's a, there's a lot of variability here. You also see that there are different colors here and they correspond to different regimes of operation in JET. Um, here we have a scan of the power and every time we're going to look at the, in that shot, at a series of elms, what is the interim time and what is the distribution? And you see here, now we can characterize how slowly that goes from this shape of distribution to something more Gaussian and then very strange to this, so this is certainly not a good model anymore, to a multimodal distribution with multiple peaks. It tells you something about the dynamics of the elms, uh, the frequency also of the elms, but also the dynamics of what processes are causing that. And maybe there are multiple processes going on uh, when you see these multiple peaks. Okay, now uh, this is uh, mitigated elms and I want to skip this because time is running. Let me go to a different application, uh, regression analysis. As scaling loss, perhaps you know that this is something that not only in fusion, in fluid dynamics, in geology, again, in, in uh, biology, one is interested in how uh, certain quantities of interest in the system and the study scale uh, with when you change certain uh, control parameters of the system. And the, more, the most uh, well-known scaling law in fusion, I, I, I could say, is that of the confinement time, the energy confinement time. How does it scale with certain plasma parameters? Well, that is the realm of regression analysis. You want to fit, it's in general going to be a multidimensional curved surface to a large set of data points. And we all know least squares. Eh? So this is one way to do that. The point here is that in, 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 um, in real settings, for instance, in fusion, the data are really very complicated. You could have measurement uncertainty, but there is certainly also going to be model uncertainty. Are you looking for a linear model? Could it be a power law or something more complicated? There might be variables that govern the behavior of, for instance, the confinement time that you're not taking into account, but they do influence the process. There could be confounding variables, variables that uh, seem to imply some correlation between the variables X and Y. So X and Y seem to be correlated, but that does not mean that they are causally related because there could be a third variable Z that influences both of them. Typically, we would like to find those processes that causally influence a certain uh, physical process, uh, such as the transport in a plasma and hence the confinement time. But that's very difficult. There are also uh, some more data related difficulties. There is this multicollinearity. Perhaps you know that if two of predictor variables, for instance, the plasma current and the magnetic field uh, in, in multi-machine databases are typically correlated, um, well, that's a problem because that introduces uncertainty on the regression variables. There is also usually going to be a lot of heterogeneity uh, certainly a multi-machine database has come from different diagnostic, different machines, and yet you want to fit a very simple model to that. And, and that is one example of this heterogeneity that is called Simpson's paradox. That means that if you collect data from many different sources, uh, you could say, okay, I want to characterize how Y depends on X. Well, uh, seems quite simple. You just fit this line through it. But then you realize that each of the, that there seem to be different subsets of data, which could be, for instance, different fusion devices. And then the picture is different. In each individual device, the, the correlation of Y with X is exactly opposite. 
Here it was a negative correlation, here it's positive. That's a, a, a paradox. It's not a paradox at all, uh, but but uh, it's it's a danger, I would rather say, of deducing certain relations from multi-machine or heterogeneous data. Um, so then, of course, the question is, which is it? What uh, correlation are you really interested in? Anyway, um, I, would, I don't want to go too deep in it, but let me just tell you something about multilinear regression. And this is the, the one of the most simple regression models where indeed y is linearly related to not one predictor variable like the plasma current, but multiple. And so it could be the magnetic field, uh, the shape of the plasma, uh, the power that goes into the plasma and so on. And this, this is a multilinear model. Yeah, you see, so you have this cutoff here, the intercept, and then a parameter that in linear fashion tells you how important is the influence of each of these predictor variables. And then, of course, again, uh, there is noise. Here, it's, it's certain, this is noise. We're not interested in this. Could be that the noise harbor some interesting information about other predictive variables but we don't take them into account because we have established this is the model and and the rest is noise often i say log linear because many scaling laws in fusion are actually assumed to be it's that there is no universal truth that tells you that it should be like that it's just computationally very simple if you have a power law you take the log on both sides. Let me see if I have an illustration of that. Yeah, for instance, the confinement scaling. You see, this is a power law. Take the log, the logarithm on both sides, and you see that it transforms to exactly something of this form, multilinearity. Um, and even that, that is my point, is difficult. It looks like a simple exercise in least squares, but the data can be so complicated, they can be outliers, you're not certain about the model, and all that introduces uncertainty and you have to somehow deal with that. So find good methods, not always the simplest one, not always least squares. It's not big, I mean, that's also the danger. Least squares is always going to give you some answer. But then the question arises, how, how certain can you be about that answer? At the very least, you want some error bars on the quantities that you estimate. Again, Bayesian probability allows you another way, gives you some another way to do that. This would then be the likelihood. So you have multiple, multiple measurements of your dependent variable Y, let's say N, and for each of your predictor variables, Let's say there are P predictor variables. Well, for each of them, you have N measurements. N measurements of the plasma current, N measurements of the magnetic field, and so on. You organize that in such a matrix. This column of ones is uh, meant to model the intercept. And this would then be your likelihood. If you assume that epsilon follows a Gaussian distribution, Let's assume for the time being that sigma is known. Well, this would be your likelihood. You see, it's a multivariate Gaussian distribution. Again, Bayes' theorem is going to invert that and tell you what is the, the probability distribution of alpha, your coefficient that you want to estimate. And one way to do that, uh, it's, it only tells you part of the, the solution is to find the maximum of the posterior distribution, the most probable value, you could say. That is called the maximum a posteriori solution or the MAP solution. So basically, you need to uh, minimize this, and then you're going to maximize this. Uh, I mentioned this because under these assumptions you see all the assumptions that go into this the model the distribution of your error bar um, under all these assumptions 
your solution, your maximum posteriority solution will be this. So it's some, uh, this is called the pseudo inverse of that matrix X. And you see that it coincides with the ordinary least square solution. So that's, that's, that's also the power I would like to mention of a Bayesian approach. It forces you to be very explicit about your assumptions. And that is how, uh, if you do that, you can derive many algorithms in machine learning from Bayesian reasoning. And with the added advantage that it tells you under what circumstances, under what assumptions, this machine learning algorithm will be valid. Yeah? So that, that's the importance of this. This is just, just a very simple illustration to tell you under what circumstances does least, does least squares give you the same answer as the Bayesian approach. Okay, so this is uh, the posterior distribution uh, because this, as I told you, gives you only part of the answer. It's the, only the maximum of the distribution. In more generality, you would also want to have error bars on the alphas and then also tell you, uh, make new predictions. For that, you have to use the posterior predictive distribution. Um, so don't just plug in your maximum a posteriori values of alpha into the uh, regression model. No, um, and, and then put in new values of the x's for a new measurement. No, you have to take into account that these values themselves also have uncertainty and you have to marginalize that out. And then you get a good distribution of a prediction. Multicollinearity, um, I, I don't have time to, to go into this, but there are various ways to detect it. It's very important in fusion databases because we tend to run the experiments in such a way that there is always going to be dependence between parameters. If you go to a larger device, typically the plasma current will go up, the magnetic field goes up, and uh, together with the power and the size of the device. So these variables are correlated. And luckily there are also ways to remediate that. And so we have been involved into a recent update of the well-known IPB 98 scaling law for the energy confinement time. This is an engineering form, dimensionless form, using new uh, data added to the global H mode confinement database. Okay, and we have done that with, yeah, you couldn't do it with least squares. It will give you an answer, but it's going to be different with uh, other methods. And one of them forces you to also take into uncertainty, not only, so what do I mean to say here is that you assume that there is an un underlying set of variables that exactly follows this model, a linear model on the log scale. At the same time, you also recognize that actually there is not only uncertainty on this one, the confinement time characterized by this epsilon, but also on each of the predictor variables. Now, least squares will not allow you to do that. And this is a way to, to take into account that uncertainty. You define variables for which you impose, they follow the exact functional um, relation. And then you're going to add uncertainty or variables that describe that uncertainty on the response variable and each of the predictor variables. And that uncertainty is going to propagate through your regression model, which here I assume to be linear. And you see that it propagates if, if everything is nicely linear and Gaussian, you know that it does that in this way yeah, with the alpha squares. So that allows you to take into, into account uncertainty also on the predictor variables. And even that was not sufficient. We also had to take into account yet another factor, which we also estimated from the data that tells you, well, actually we know that there is an additional uncertainty uh, 
for each device in the database that is not only caused by that measurement uncertainty, but other uh, sources of uncertainty as well. And then you're going to estimate, this is going to be a complicated probability distribution for the parameters, which are the, the coefficients in your scaling law, and you have to estimate them. And then you see that uh, MCMC comes in. So what I'm going to show you now is a little animation where you see the sampling of the parameter, two parameters in that scaling law. The exponent for the current and the exponent for the uh, major radius. And you, you will see that those two parameters are correlated. And yeah, so here you have alpha r and alpha i for current and, and radius. And I, I show you the, the work of different chains, MCMC chains, and I zoom in. And you see they started, let me run this again. So this chain started very far from where it actually had to sample. The most of the probability is here. So here you see gradually a joint distribution arising and you see that this, the algorithm is sampling from that distribution. And if you do that in, in, in all the dimensions, you would get something like this. So the one that I just showed you is alpha i, alpha r, this one. So you see that there is a correlation. Uh, and these are the individual distributions estimated using the Bayesian way for uh, the plasma current exponent eh, in the power law, magnetic fields, density, power, radius, and so on, and their correlations. Um, here you have some of the dependencies and what, what was also an important contribution of this work is that we recognize that actually the, the error bars are really quite large. And in fact, you see that the dependence of the confinement time on, on the current, the power and the radius is quite well uh, characterized, but the others much wider error bars. So it's important to, to state that, to be very clear about that. We also developed a re another regression method that is again based on that information geometry that works by calculating distances between predicted and observed distributions, but I don't have time to go into that. And then this is the uh, newly proposed scaling from 2020, uh, which shows you that the error bars are quite large. And, and uh, yeah, some of the dependencies are a bit different. Notably, we are currently looking into that dependence on major radius, which used to be almost quadratic in the IPP98. And apparently under with, with the new data, uh, and this all methods, all various regression methods re agree on, it's only slightly above linear with the uh, caveat that if alpha, you see that here, if alpha r goes down, uh, alpha i will go up. And um, so because they are negatively uh, correlated. Um, and you see that also in the prediction. The prediction for ether is not so far off. It's a bit lower, that's clear, but it's not so far off. Uh, the, 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 the value that was predicted in 98, luckily. Although there is an, uh, and that is due to the correlation between the predict predictor values. Uh, there is quite some uncertainty on that. Then finally, I want to say something very quickly about information integration, where you use Bayesian methods to um, integrate data from multiple diagnostics, you could call it data fusion. That is actually the term that is used in computer science. Fuse data from multiple diagnostics to become more certain or to exploit redundancies or uh, complementarity between different diagnostics and, and come to a better estimate of some plasma quantity. And then what you do in the Bayesian way, you have some measurement model and you, you have a corresponding likelihood 
for diagnostic A and you want to estimate Q. And then I have another diagnostic B and a likelihood B. And I want to estimate Q. Well, very simple. I just assume that they are statistically uh, um, independent and I multiply the likelihoods. Then you obtain the posterior distribution and that will be usually have a smaller error bar uh, than uh, if you would have used to, to diagnostic separately. So data fusion, sensor fusion, integrated data analysis, that's how it's called. Uh, and we use that, for instance, for tomography as well. Um, this is using a Gaussian process. I don't want to go into the mathematics, but basically you see it here. This is a cross-section of soft, it's synthetic data, but soft X-ray emissivity in the West Tokamak, uh, the geometry, and each pixel that you see is an estimate of the emissivity there, and it follows a Gaussian distribution. And there is correlation between the pix between neighboring pixels. And that's what the Gaussian process allows you to do, to impose that correlation. If there were no correlation, you would see just a noisy image because the, the emissivity would wildly fluctuate from one pixel to another. It's thanks to the correlation that you see a structured image. And this is with a prior probability that uh, in the Bayesian way allows you to do that. Um, well, the advantage also being that the posterior distribution is with this linear tomographic model, again, a uh, Gaussian distribution. So you can do this in real time, actually. Uh, so you can create this type of tomographic reconstruction. This was the real image. This is the reconstructed image. You can do that in real time because it's a closed form distribution. Finally, we want to eventually do this in an integrated way. That means that we are actually interested in West in the tungsten concentration. Perhaps you know that West has also uh, tungsten um, plasma facing components. And so some of that tungsten makes it into the plasma. We want to know in a poloidal cross section, how is the tungsten distributed? It tells us something about impurity transport and and also hopefully allows us to control the impurity content in the plasma. But for that, you have to measure the soft X-ray emissivity. You have to measure the plasma density, the electron density with, for instance, interferometry. And you have to measure the temperature with ECE, for instance. So you mix in all that data in practice, you're going to multiply the likelihoods, and that gives you one big posterior distribution from which, by marginalization, you're going to be able to estimate jointly tungsten concentration, electron density, electron temperature, and possibly even transport coefficients uh, in a more uh, uh, um, accurate way than you would have been able to do by uh, sequential. Um, processing of the data. Eventually, we will want to make this real time by training a neural network uh, to emulate this Bayesian um, inference process. So we give the neural network a lot of data um, of, um, of the, the Bayesian inference, and we're going to tell it to emulate that. And then you can learn that, that mapping and do it in a real time way. And finally, anomaly detection and predictive maintenance is something that is we started to do more recently. So it's all about maintenance, of course. Usually what you do in a device uh, or a component or a production line in industry, if something breaks, well, then you want to repair it. But more clever would be able would would be if you would be able to predict that. So you're going to monitor the system, for instance, some component in a fusion device with sensors. It could be diagnostics, but could also be vibration sensors, temperature sensors, and so on. And you're going to train a machine learning model to predict when something is going to fail just by looking at the sensor measurements and 
monitoring when something is going into an anomalous area of the operational space. You see that very clearly here. So this is a turbo pump at jet. And, and these are measurements over a long time of operation. Uh, and, and this is some feature that tells you something about the operation of that pump. And you see that it, as time evolves, suddenly you see that this is going into an anomalous region. And uh, then you, you could predict that and prevent the pump from becoming destroyed because this totally blew up, it was totally destroyed. And it creates downtime of the machine, repair costs, downtime for experimentation, but eventually a higher cost of electricity because you there was unforeseen um, time during which the machine didn't operate. Now we're also applying this to big uh, electrical switches in jet, but my point here is that so you see again an anomaly is producing itself here. My point is here that for us we are convinced that it is going to become extremely important in fusion reactors uh, because you want the device to run in an uneventful way as possible and to be able to predict these anomalies. So don't wait until something goes wrong, but predict it and then be able to possibly react or to schedule at the very least uh, uh, maintenance. And this is, uh, you could also do that in real time in the, for the plasma itself. So for instance, this is a prediction of the plasma density uh, in in, uh, in in D3D at in um, in some point in space and time uh, uh, or evolving in time, so the black one is the the target what you, what was was measured. Um, the blue one is a, quite a simple neural network that was trained on historical data, and you see that when something changes it's not very well able to follow that trend. It's completely off. And the point of this exercise was to train a more advanced neural network that can take in data and adapt as the data is coming in in real time. And you see that the, 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 the better one, the green one, uh, it is also confused for for let's say half a second, but then it it sees this new data coming in and it again picks up, uh, and, and and is able always more or less half a second in advance to predict what the density will be half a second later. For a fusion plasma, half a second is like an eternity, so that's very important. In half a second, there's a lot of things you can do to be able to restore the plasma to a safe state. All right, so my conclusions are um, from this very quick and very admittedly rather wide overview of applications of probability and, and, and data science and machine learning in fusion. My conclusions are, don't be misled that nowadays it's only machine learning. Machine learning is one field in data science, a subset of data science. And there is a, a lot more than that. And so probability and statistics also plays a very important role in that and could even uh, and even form foundations of machine learning to better understand how these algorithms work. Data rich communities such as Fusion need a good data science culture. And there, I think there's a lot, still a long way to go to convince um, uh, the community. Yeah? So mostly, engineers and physicists that there is a lot more um, uh, open uh, ground to cover where there is possibility for collaboration um, where you even have you know nowadays you have things like data driven uh, um, sorry uh, physics in yeah, data-driven physics, <laughs> but uh, so so you you try to find new physics from the data, or the other way around to constrain machine learning models by known physics. So 
it's not too, you know, do you have these two ends of the spectrum, data science and, and physics? in our infusion but there's a lot of commonalities and and uh, we should be able to cover that gap between the two and i think we're only starting to do that so of course there's a lot of applications to fusion plasma physics and fusion engineering of data science physics aware data science that are what, what i just mentioned is gaining importance and one thing that i again want to stress information integration so using data from multiple sensors and predictive maintenance to me are going to be essential for fusion reactors, demo, whatever you want to call it, uh, the machines that uh, eventually will have to produce electricity. Some references, I, I think, so this is going to be, uh, this is being recorded so you can look at it at your own leisure about, this is about Bayesian uh, data analysis from the more um uh you know so the 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 real uh theory and applications to the machine learning also based on bayesian uh, methods to the more philosophical or let's say the foundations of probability theory itself and then some some more applications on in wide areas um and then finally i want to say so uh, my uh, my group in Ghent is called Infusion, uh, fusion of the word fusion and inference or information, because indeed we use uh, and we apply fusion data science, solid mathematical foundations, numerous applications. This is our website, and and probably uh, you're many of you are already familiar with Fusion EP since you might be an alumnus of that network. Uh, so the European Master of Science in Nuclear Fusion and Engineering Physics. This, by the way, is the new logo. Um, the website is also, uh, it, it was quite uh, necessary, I will admit, but we're also updating the website and that, that should be come online hopefully in the next month or two. So, and and of course, we 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 are still continuing as this two year inter university masters with eight full partners um uh, in fusion and um the the unfortunately the so i'm a bit too late to advertise the current round of applications that has finished for the next cohort but there will be a next round of applications with a deadline in february 24 so if you're interested in applying for a grant, and because this is a European grant, I encourage you to do so by all means. All right. Thank you very much. Go, sorry for going a little bit over time, and I'll happily take your questions. Thank you. Um, thank you so very much, uh, Professor, for the wonderful, insightful uh, masterclass. Uh, I think... Um, uh, there is no need to apologize because it was all engrossing and we we definitely are quite happy to have had uh, such a nice dose of uh, foundations of, of uh, data science and fusion. Um, I will now uh, open the session for questions and answers. And while people are thinking about questions to ask, I myself have a question because I have been working uh, in the field of data science in uh, fusion application. Um, what what interests me is the the topic when you mentioned the predictive uh, maintenance. You know, um, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure uh, there is the line open, and someone might, maybe yourself uh, are interested in working with that. Uh, what are the scopes of uh, using the predictive maintenance uh, for disruption prediction and avoidance? Ah, uh, okay, that's a good that's a good question. Um, because I didn't mention it, although I might have alluded to it, but I, I didn't mention that indeed disruption prediction is one case of what you could call predictive maintenance avant la lettre. So it's, uh, it has been done for a long time. So you use sensor measurements, in this case from diagnostics, and you're going in, in real time, uh, going to monitor those sensor measurements um, and with machine learning models from historical, trained on historical data, uh, you're going to try to foresee when certain uh, 
plasma quantities are going into an area of that that could lead to a disruption uh, so this is definitely something that that has been done for a long time what is different i would say i mean the methodology you could say is different the time scales are different of course because here we're talking about for instance with these pumps you see the time scale is in hours here for the for the switches this switch has to operate every uh, pulse at the very start of every pulse it has to interrupt a large current that feeds the uh, ohmic heating circuit and uh, but it has to interrupt that current at a very specific time if, if it doesn't it's called a failure and you see this is a this this is on a, an, on a time scale of pulses so it could be days or weeks or something for disruption prediction it will be of course on a time scale or of tens or at most a few hundreds of milliseconds um i think both um uh, so, so I would say also what is different is that we, with this predictive maintenance, are are applying this to, like as you see, these these uh, pumps or the switches, and now or also more recently, I didn't show it, but uh, also more recently on plasma facing components, which are also being monitored, for instance, with infrared cameras, and uh, you could. What is important, of course, is monitor. But what we really would like to do is be able to predict when, for instance, a component is going to overheat, because there might be some precursors to that. Again, the time scales are probably going to be somewhat different. So we are with this activity now trying to uh, apply this and also give the message that it's important to apply this, these methodologies to not only the plasma like in disruption prediction but uh, many other components uh, you know a fusion power plant is much more than the plasma only eh? so there are all the the subsystems around it the, the even the diagnostics themselves could be monitored for good operation um and uh, and each of them could benefit from well certainly from monitoring but perhaps also from predictive maintenance uh, but you're right that the disruption prediction is is in fact also predictive maintenance yes absolutely i mean maybe uh <clears throat> just while you were explaining this yeah as as you pointed out that um maintenance maybe we, we term it uh, we associate with the proper functioning of the whole uh, compound system right so mm, if someone really wants to be very picky maybe they could uh term it slightly differently uh, differently in terms of um, when it comes to disruption prediction we could let's say we could call it predictive operation or something like that i don't know because it at some point it also becomes part of the operation of a of a reactor of a device mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. so yeah because just when i saw this i was like yeah maybe because i have studied a little bit the jet systems etc and, and and right um the system that we have right now in part of the production scenario etc they, they they respond and they respond on a different time scales mm -hmm. right yeah. right 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 thank you and, thank and, you so much uh, yeah and so what have you been uh, working on i have worked uh, on on uh, um, a predictor a linear model for a disruption predictors for jet uh, oh okay for jet yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, which basically uh, is based on 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 mode locked signal mode right locking. yeah because mm -hmm. uh, if we really want to go to a linear model then uh, without uh, losing the um, the let's say without complicating the physical meaning physical interpretation of the of the model because we can definitely use seven eight signals uh it has been done in the past uh using a portus and and all sort of mm. uh, models but at the end of the day uh you come out with some sort of a uh, scaling law if i may like uh, put it in a very vague in a very you know vulgar way um the the idea of uh, coming up with uh, with a linear model is basically the biggest advantage being um, uh, adaptability uh, changing uh, to a new device uh, and then you could further use different uh, ways to train you might not necessarily need to rely on historical data you could also use uh, approximation from scratch and, and training on the go modes where you could say okay i'll start operating the machine 
and I'll, I'll learn, I'll train my model accordingly. Obviously, um, what happens is that you have to rely on a very, very, very um, um, sure precursor when it comes to disruption prediction, when you want to do it in a simple linear model, because um, the surety of the precursor also comes from uh, the fact that uh, the stronger the detection of the precursor, the, the closer the disruption is. It gives you very little time to to re react, respond, and and try to derive the the plasma in a non dangerous, let's say, mm. quiescent uh, regime of operation. Yeah, you measure. You mentioned an important point. Um, also, an important message. I think if people you know dive into machine learning they're very excited to apply some complicated model but uh, one should not forget that indeed um the start with the simplest model like you say a linear model is about the simplest uh, uh that that one could think of and um it and and surprisingly often that already works quite well and then you have to do use that as a benchmark and possibly improve on it always keeping in mind not only the fact that maybe your performance could go up but if your uh, um, the computational load also goes up um, uh, then for instance you lose the ability of uh, adapting in real time to in, in new incoming data which of obviously with a linear model is going to be much faster uh, and also the interpretation capability uh, you're right that with scaling laws it's also not always that clear but at least you have a clear view on what parameters if you normalize properly you at least you have and a view of what prop what what uh, parameters are important uh how the dependence more or less looks like so interpretability is there uh very important and that's what a, a simple model has as an advantage compared to some complicated model the last point indeed being um the amount of data that you need for training which in fusion is not always so much uh we, you don't need so much data or that's also some a common misconception people think okay you're going to do statistics um or machine learning that means you need a large database that's certainly not always the case many interesting data analysis problems arise exactly for the lack of data um which induces uncertainty what is true that is if you have some complicated model like a neural network with lots of parameters then you will need a lot of data to train that um, but this is one uh, uh, model here uh, which combines a bit the best of both worlds uh, so that was used here and there uh, our postdoc applied this uh, so-called reservoir computing network that on the one hand keeps the hidden layers untrained so they are just initialized randomly and only the output layer here is retrained when new data come in but it's linear and you might wonder yeah but how is that ever going to work if you don't retrain the the hidden layers well the idea is that you project that's what eventually a neural network also does you project your data to a, a high dimensional space and there it's well known that low dimensional data might not be clearly um, structured but if you go to a higher dimensional space you might be able to recognize certain patterns that were not not, not visible in the, pro the low dimensional projection so that is how this works it combines a bit uh, the, the, the advantages of the linearity with those of um, an, an, a projecting in high dimensional space is what the neural network does. I think this could be a very good uh, model and it hasn't been tried for as far as I know uh, until now. No, no, definitely, definitely. It's the first time that I heard of uh, the RCN concept and it really uh looks uh, quite appealing because uh, at the end of the day, the readout layer, as you say, is uh, is quite uh, uh, 
supposedly it has to be a bit more uh, easily interpretable while without losing the the complexity of uh, projection in uh, n-dimensional plane where correctly said uh, you could see the patterns and, and 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 clustering of different parameters in different spaces uh thank you so very much i will definitely have a look at the the article i don't see any hand raised uh from the audience uh so i would say uh mm, no one uh, wants to ask any question uh so that being the case i would really like to thank uh, Gert, uh once again for uh for uh, helping us with relaunch uh yes uh, um as you correctly saw sometimes um then at least in this uh, day and age we see that uh, the moment you you stop even for a while it's it's uh, difficult to start again so we really appreciate your your uh, presence your your uh, talk and your knowledge and uh, we'll count uh, on you for the future uh, next masterclass or any new initiative that we become from mm -hmm. yeah. thank you All so right. very much you're welcome <laughs>